Hi, this is Joe Chambers. This is part two of our vault clip with Steve Cropper shot back in 2008. Hope you enjoy it. And also, if you like it, remember to hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. To tell you about Soul Man, we had progressed uh, quite a ways when Soul Man came around. And uh, it hadn't been that long since we had uh, purchased our first four track. And we went from a mono machine to mono two track machine to a four track machine. And uh, I think Sun, whenever they were coming up, they had a three track machine. That was a lot of the old uh, Elvis records and a lot of the Jerry Lee Lewis records. They, they were cut on three track. And, and they did pretty much the same thing we did in terms of uh, they would cut more of a, a stereo mixed track with everything sort of live, and that third track got to be that slap back echo you hear on some of those records, which was an interesting process. And we used to do, do the same thing later. Uh, there was, it was just something that, that just gave that, the record just some great color and some great sound effects. You know. uh, Soul Man, um, boy, I worked on that record pretty hard. That was pretty much cut live. We might have uh, overdubbed uh, uh, maybe some percussion, but what it did, it opened us up to be able to mix better. So we'd put the vocals with Sam and Dave sang on one microphone, and we would split the band. So we would cut a, a stereo band track and have the vocal on a track by itself, and then we left ourselves one track to either bounce down and do stuff later or do that overdub with either you know, hand claps or backgrounds, and we'd have to pick and choose. On some of the songs that required strings, we had a string track. So that's the first time we were allowed to do that. It was, it was great, and uh, it just opened up a whole world of music to us. We never knew that music would advance to where it has today. I had an engineer tell me one time, and we were already, uh, I think we already had a 16 track in there by then. I know we had the 8 track. And it was an engineer from California that came in for a while uh, that had worked for Leon Russell. And he said, you know, Steve, he said, I, he said, I pretty much know where recording is going to go. And he said, if I had the, the tools, he said, I could put that together. He said, one of these days, you'll have multi, multi, multi track meaning you can overdub as much as you want to. You won't be restricted to a four track, eight track, 16 track, 24, 32, whatever. Uh, it, it, he said that you're gonna have multi-track. Well, the development of the computer has done that. And now these kids can sit at home on their laptop, you know, with a MacBook and just overdub, you know, till doomsday. The only problem is they have to remix that stuff when it's all over with. And that's a lot of energy fighting each other, you know. So if, I, if there's a downside to, to today's music, it would be that there's just too much energy fighting for space. It was much easier when we were just cutting mono. It also seems like, you know, you get a lot of stuff that you don't really need on a record because they can. They yeah. do it because they can. Yeah. As a guitar player, I mean, how, I mean, you come up with these, these, these great <coughs> riffs that are just timeless. How did that, I mean, you're, you were a young guy too. I mean, how did you know to to do that? I mean, I mean, I don't, I don't really know. That. That's not. I said probably a hard question, but but when you're sitting there and you've got the chords and you've got the lyrics and you know you need an intro, how how did you how did you just say, okay, well, we're gonna we're gonna do the guitar and how about this? <laughs> well, it's really hard to define a, a style of any kind of music, especially guitar guitar music and. You know, I've, I've been known to have developed a certain style, and, and part of it uh, came out of just the necessity of it all. And the style that I play is a, is a little bit of rhythm, you know, and then every now and then a fill or two. Uh, you don't do that today because you hire two guitar players. Sometimes you hire three or four. I've been on sessions where there were five other guitar players beside me all plugged in, and it's what's kind of crazy. But when you can only afford one guy, and you, you weren't allowed to overdub, I had the job of being two guys at one time. I had to play a little rhythm and every now and then play a fill. And it was really more like, uh, I don't know, it was, it was just uh, adding kind of color, you know, to, to the music. And the way if anybody wants to go listen to the records and listen to my style, they will notice that very seldom if I'm playing a lick do I play on top of the vocalist. I play on the holes. And I wait till the vocalist finishes a line and then I'll kind of embellish it and continue the line 
and get off of it and go back to rhythm when they come back in. And it's really all about feel, and a lot of it was just accidental, but I mean, it was accidentally on purpose. <laughs> but that's sort of how that, that whole style developed. I still play that way today. For guitar players, what kind of strings do you use and gauge and stuff like that? Well, in the old days, strings on a guitar. You know, in the old days, I played what they call the Gibson Sonomatic strings. And it said, uh, nickel-plated electric guitar set. <laughs> I didn't know what gauge they were. Uh, but the, the thing that changed and changed my life about strings is that the, the Gibson Sonomatic strings used to come in an orange box, and uh, one through six, and the G string was a wound string. And they used to break a lot because you try to, you know, really lay onto those and they were a thinner and wound string. And Chip's moment of all people came to me one day and he said, Steve, have you ever played with an unwound G string? And I said, no. And he said, you ought to try it sometime. He said, you know, a lot of those country pickers, they get a, get a lot of bend out of doing that. And I didn't know you could go buy an unwound G. So I would use a, a B string. I'd use two Bs. So I'd use a, a, an E and two Bs and then go on down D, A, E. And uh, that seemed to work, and that's the sound that's on Green Onions, that, that opening guitar uh, solo lick, that thing, you know, is all done with an unwound G, so. Okay, Could, would you tell that story about, I mean, it was an accident, right? I mean, y'all were just jamming, right? It happened. What, on Green Onions? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, Story behind Green Onions, uh, Jim Stewart had booked a Sunday session, which was more of a demo, because we worked uh, five days a week, Monday through Friday, and all the guys, most of the guys, except for myself, had uh, night gigs, you know, they be, had to be on stage by nine o'clock usually, and doing four sets a night, sometimes five. And uh, anyway, we were there to cut an artist named Billy Lee Riley, who's pretty famous. You may have him hanging on the wall around here somewhere. and. Uh, Jim had talked to Billy about cutting some stuff on him. I think Billy had recorded over at Sun or somewhere. And uh, anyway, he didn't show up for the session, and we were just kind of waiting on him, and we were just jamming on some stuff. And, and Jim still expected Billy to show up. And um, we just started jamming on some blues just to kind of warm up our instruments and just kind of keep from being bored to death, you know. We're sitting there waiting on this guy. Usually it's the other way around. It's usually the, the singer's waiting on the musicians to show up. <clears throat> but that day... Uh, we were just playing and just jamming on some blues, just some, some blues and F that we would do on stage, you know, just to mark the time, to just add, you know, to the night. And uh, we finished it, and I remember if I still had the tape, uh, I remember the end, we just were laughing. We just thought it was funny, you know, hey, that's pretty good, da 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 And Jim got on the talk back and said, hey, guys, he said, come up, come up here and listen to this. And we go, what, you put that down? He said, yeah. He was already set up to record, so he just reached over and pushed the record button. <laughs> so there we were listening to this thing, and Jim Stewart just fell in love with it. He thought it was great, you know. And uh, it was a song that turned out to, uh, the title of it turned out to be the B-side of Green Onions called Behave Yourself. At the, at the time, it didn't have a title. But what was funny about it is Jim Stewart said, uh, he said, that's pretty good. He said, if we decide to put, put that out, he said, if you guys got another song, you can put on the B-side. He called it the B-side. And we said, uh, no. I mean, we looked at each other. We didn't sit around and write all the time, you know. Booker and I wrote a little bit, and, and uh, I looked at Booker, and I said, I don't know. I said, I said, I remember you played me a, some kind of riff or a lick about two weeks prior to that session. And uh, he said, I don't know. He said, well, I think I might remember. And he goes out on the organ, and he starts playing the kind of the Green Onions lick that we know, you know. I said, yeah, that's it, that's it. So Al sat down, and Louis sat down on the bass, and we started jamming on this thing. And, and uh, Jim said, that's pretty catchy. He said, you know, let's get an arrangement on this. And so we, we did this thing. And so Jim said, uh, you know, that's pretty good. He said, but Steve, he said, that thing you're doing in the middle of the song, he said, why don't you put that on the intro? Just do that on the intro and play a verse like that. Then let Booker play. And then you do a regular solo. And I went, oh, OK. And that was the take. I put these chank things I was doing on the intro. Booker plays two verses, I played a solo, Booker played a verse, and that was it, it was out. And it was just sort of an accident in a way. And uh, so I, uh, the, the good part of the story, I, I love telling this part of the story. Uh, I went ahead and, and, uh, and leadered it off and all, and I called Scotty Moore the next day. For people who don't know Scotty Moore, I'm sure you do if you're watching this stuff, is uh, he was Elvis's guitar player. 
He was also a guitar player for Sun Records and he also liked to engineer. He used to call me over to do some sessions because he wanted to engineer like Chip's moment did. So I was this lucky guy that <laughs> got to play on some of these sessions. But anyway, I called Scott and I said, you know, yesterday I said, well, I think we cut a pretty good song. I said, would you cut me a dub on it? And he said, sure, come on over, you know. So I went over there and we fired up, you know, and he fires a lay it up and all that. And he's, man, Steve, he said, that's pretty catchy. He said, what do you call that? And I said, well, we don't have a name for it yet. I just said, I just know it's good. And um, I said, I'm going to see if I can get my buddy to, I want, I want one, of, one of my disc jockey friends to hear it. So he cuts this dub. The next morning, I go down to my friend Reuben Washington, who was on uh, uh, WLOK radio station. He had the drive, drive time slot. And I went down there, and I used to go down there and just hang out with him anyway. And we were kind of good friends, and he'd come by the record shop, and we'd hang out some, you know. <clears throat> and I said, uh, I want you to listen to this thing. I said, we cut it Sunday afternoon. Tell me what you think. So he put it on a turntable. He's playing another record on the air, and he put it on a turntable, and he played the intro, and, he, and then he played about two or three bars of the verse, and he just stopped it and backed it up. The other record got through playing. He just hit it and spun it, put it out on the air. I said, is that going, I saw the red light come on that term. I said, is that going out on the air? And he said, yeah. I said, man, I said, okay. I said, you hadn't even heard it yet. He said, no, it's good enough. He hears it, backs it up and plays it again. He played it four times in a row and the phones lit up. People couldn't believe it. They said, who is that? Where can we buy this? What do you call that? Da, 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 da. And he said, I can't tell you and there's no name for it, <laughs> you know. Anyway, we got through, and he's laughing about it and all that. And he said, man, you better tell the guys to get serious about that, you know. And uh, so I went back to the record shop, and they said, what did you do? And I said, what? And they said, the phones are ringing off the wall. Everybody's wanting to buy this thing that you had them playing on the radio. We were listening, you know. I said, you got to be kidding. So we called Jim Stewart. He was still working at the bank, worked in the trust department at the bank downtown. And, and we told him, said, Jim, on your lunch break, you better get by the studio because we got, we got something going on here. And we told him, <clears throat> excuse me. So we told him all about it, and uh, and he said, "Well, we got to do something." And it wasn't the side he liked; it was the up tempo side. And so we called the guys in, and we said, "We got to get a name for this thing, get it on the label, and so forth." And so I can tell you now that Louis Steinberg had played bass on it. When we're hashing around ideas, we came up with all kind of crazy ideas, and he said, "Why don't you call it Onions?" He said, "Cause that's the stinkingest music I ever heard," you know. And I went, yeah, that's pretty good, but you know, onions is kind of a negative. I, I don't deal in negatives. I said, isn't onions a little negative? You know, they make people's eyes burn. Some people don't like them, gives them indigestion and all that. And I said, what about green onions? I said, a lot of people eat green onions, you know, with their dinner and everything like that. And they went, yeah, green onions. So that, that was the title. And uh, I think the other title came about when, uh, on the flip side, the song I mentioned earlier, Behave Yourself, which was just a blues ballad thing. Uh, Al Jackson actually said on the session, "I'll oh, behave yourself," you know, like that, you know, and that's where that came from. So there we had the record. Uh, it, it came out as Vote 102. It was the second release on Vote Records, and uh, the the thing I, I jumped in the car on that Friday. Well, that that afternoon I went down and and put it in the vat. We made the stampers up. We had the, had the title and all that, and had that all printed up. Put the stampers on it. I put it in the vat that night. And on, let's see, that was a Tuesday evening. And Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I went down and I picked up a box of 25 records and got with my buddy Bill Biggs, <clears throat> who was a, a promotion guy that hit all the one stops and, and the jukebox operators and stuff. And I said, can I tag along and we go hit some of these stations? And he just thought that was a great idea, you know. So I jumped in the car with him with a box of records and we started hitting. Tupelo and Jackson, Mississippi, and went over to Four City, Arkansas, and then all the way to Little Rock, and hit all these things. And all of a sudden, then they all started playing this record, and they were just glad to see anybody. They said, "This is great. Nobody ever comes to see us, you know, in these little towns." And we got the saturated play on one weekend, and it just the calls came in like crazy because it really was a good record. And uh, Atlantic finally got wind of it, and they said, "You guys have a hit." One thing's wrong. You're going to have to get it off a Volt label because we don't need to be promoting another label. So we put it on stacks. I went down, we changed the stampers and got records the next week. Went to number one. Vote. Huh? Vote. What was Vote? <clears throat> Vote was a subsidiary. Um, everybody had a subsidiary. Atlantic, Atco. I think, what was it, King Simplicity or King Federal? They had a label. I mean, there were so many labels that had it. And, and, and what it did for you was that it allowed you to sort of get out more product. 
you know. You, you can only just promote so much a day or a week, you know. And you could go on a station with two or three records instead of just one or two. That was the reason for it. So Volt was a subsidiary of Stack. Yeah, it was just Atlantic had Adco and Jim said, we need a second label, you know. And they just come up with this Volt records, you know, with a little Volt with a lightning bolt. <clears throat> and they wanted to put um, Otis Redding on Volt. Otis was really the one that made Volt famous. All right. How did um, Isaac progress into being a producer and writer and, and all that? Well, you know, Isaac's career is, is, is real interesting. I told you uh, we hired Isaac Hayes to actually be a piano player. And all about the same time, now, David Porter had already been on the label as a singer, had been hanging around as a writer, uh, was working across the street as a, a grocery sacker or whatever. <clears throat> and. Uh, you know, when he'd have a break or something, he'd come over to the record shop or come over to the studio, and he was always bringing, I wrote this last night, or I wrote this last week, or da 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 da, and always showing his songs, trying to get Rufus or anybody to cut his songs. And uh, so Isaac, uh, you know, wanted to be a writer too. We didn't really know that. Uh, so we hired him, and, and about that same time, we hired David uh, as a staff songwriter, and we put the two together. David really wasn't a musician. I don't, I don't even think David played anything. He was a great singer and had a great feel and all, a very good lyricist and a good writer. So, so he really needed somebody to write with. And here's this new guy on the block, you know, that came in. And we put the two together. And, I mean, they just started immediately writing great songs. I mean, Isaac had all these wonderful chord changes and ideas. And uh, they wrote so many great songs, you know, from You Don't Know Like I Know, Hold On, I'm Coming, and, you know, of course, The Number One Soul Man. So. Wayne Jackson and Andrew Love. Well, Wayne, the, the Memphis Horns. <laughs> Wayne Jackson and Andrew Love. Uh, the Memphis Horns is something they decided they wanted to promote, which is a good thing because they were from Memphis. Uh, Andrew and Wayne went along with the, uh, they had been playing some sessions uh, at Stax. Wayne had been with us from our high school band, uh, along with Packy Axton and Don Nix, were the three horn players in our in our band, and they were the touring marquees when we went out with that. Uh, when when the fascination sort of fell off from the marquees, there wasn't that much work for them anymore. Um, the newness had kind of worn off of uh, the song last night. I mean, some people can tour the rest of their life on one hit, and that was being difficult because you had so many guys out there to feed. It wasn't just one guy doing a pickup band. You had this whole band. So anyway, they. You know, some of the gigs kind of fell off. They wasn't working as much, so Wayne was home more, and we started using Wayne on sessions and, and teamed him up with Andrew Love. Now, we had a great uh, tenor player named Gilbert Caples, and uh, Don Roby from Duke Peacock Records out of Houston, I think, came down and, and made uh, Gilbert a big offer, a lot more than we were paying him, uh, to go down there and, and be a, a staff player down there, and he did with Joe Scott and uh, they did a lot of records, but we lost a great tenor player. Uh, we had another guy named Gene Parker for a while, and, and we couldn't get him all the time. And then Andrew Love came along, and there we had Andrew. So Andrew Love and Joe Arnold and Wayne Jackson were the three horns that went on tour when we did the Stax Volt Tour in 1967 with Otis Redding and Eddie Floyd and so forth. And uh, that became a historical tour. I, probably main, mainly because of the loss of Otis, but it was a great tour. Uh, we finally took, uh, you know, that music to Europe. The music record-wise was already big. We were one of the, probably one of the first times, I'm, I'm not sure it was the first, but it was probably one of the first times that the, the band, the musicians that played on the session were the same guys that went and played on stage almost unheard of. That's just something you didn't do. Because session musicians were session musicians and road guys were road guys. They just didn't mix the two. And that time we did it and it worked really well. It, it, Otis said, I've got to have you guys. I've got to have you guys. We said, Otis, we can't do it. It's impossible. We can't be in two places at the same time. We've already got more work than we can do backed up. You know, we're just overloaded as it is. Because of that tour being so successful, it was Jerry Wexler's idea to put us on the Monterey Pop Festival which is one of the original, you know, festivals 
rock festivals. And there we were playing for these people in the rain and they went crazy when they heard Otis Redding. And, and we did the show, the same kind of show. We opened up with uh, Booker T and EMGs. We played Green Onions and everybody had heard that one. And then we brought out the horns, the marquees, boom. And we did last night and played that one. Everybody went crazy. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the star of the show, Mr. Otis Redding. And the place went berserk. And it'll always go down in history. And of course, you know, they made a film about it and so forth. And it was, it was really the, uh, the first real rock festival, I guess. Did you meet uh, Hendrix there? Oh, many times. Jimi Hendrix. I mean, at, at Monterey, did you meet him? <clears throat> yeah, I think so. And did you we, got to be, we got to be buddies. Uh, Jimmy and I got to be buddies a little later. We played um, Devonshire Downs uh, Rock Festival together. Uh, and there was another one. There was one in San Francisco. I can't remember the name of it that we played together. We would have played together at Woodstock, but Al Jackson would not get on a helicopter. And there was a 25 mile car pile up, no way in, no way out, except by motorcycle or helicopter. And he wasn't gonna get on either one. And we sat in a hotel room in New York City and didn't do Monterey, I mean, didn't do Woodstock because Al Jackson had a fear of flying on a helicopter. <laughs> so we'd have been there for the big, big moment of burning the guitar, you know. I'm glad I didn't go. I might have had to burn mine too, because it's, you know. You were there though, you were in Monterey. <laughs> in my, well, Monterey I was there. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, me being from Columbus, Georgia, I was brought up, and I remember colored white. And so, it, what I wanted to ask you, and I, and I heard some other stuff. Go ahead. I'm not going to get into it I, very yeah, much. Yeah, I, I know. I know what you're saying. I'll tell you why. Because it didn't exist, yeah. and there's no sense of making it exist. It didn't happen. Right. And, and that's not what I'm going for. I'm just but it's confusing to the people out there that are history buffs because there was a lot going on, but it wasn't going on with us. Well. This is what this is all I want to say about that. No, no. How did um, how did that not how was that not um, because I, I can't imagine com, from, coming from my background in, in Georgia in Columbus um, there there would have been, it would have been difficult to have a mixed band playing at where would you play it and how could you go into a a, 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 a club that was predominantly black and not get hassled and how could why it's going to predominantly white club play and not get happy. Didn't happen. I never, I never really had a problem. Um, knowing that it existed, there were a few places down south, south, uh, which is where you say you were from, that we had a little difficulty with it, meaning that we couldn't stay in the same hotel together. That's about all it meant. All, all that meant was that we had to drive on the outskirts of town to a motel where they needed the clients. They didn't care. So we didn't stay in a lot of downtown hotels in some of the larger cities in the south. Up north, never had a problem. Never had a problem in Tennessee when we would play Illinois, Tennessee, those places. We never ever had any problem whatsoever. Um, and we weren't affected as a band. We, we were a mixed band. At first, it, it was I was the only white guy in the band, and later we were, there were two and two. But, we didn't have that problem about getting food from different windows and, and, and drinking out of different fountains and, you know, it, it, we just didn't have that problem. But it definitely existed down south. I mean, it, there, were, there were times where, uh, you know, riding in the same car, if somebody looked in the window, didn't go down well, you know. I didn't even know, being from Memphis, Tennessee, I never had a clue that that even existed. I mean, it was, it was a way of life everybody accept, accepted. And, you know, there was definitely segregation when I grew up, but I didn't think about it. They had white schools, they had black schools. Okay, big deal. I mean, I'm sure your school's great, my school's great. Come and visit my school. I mean, we didn't, you know, and as far as the band, we'd visit each other's houses, we'd go to clubs together, we hung out together, you know, we'd, we'd go have a barbecue together or whatever, and never even thought about it. Nobody said anything about that. It was just unbelievable. Some, and then somebody somewhere, I'm not going to name names of where I think it, history went, but somebody had to change all of that, you know. And uh, there were a lot of places where it really did need changing. It just didn't need changing at the time in Memphis, but it, it did anyway. So Memphis was not like that as a city? It just didn't, it didn't feel like that. It didn't to me. I mean, that's not the way we grew up. We just grew up loving and respecting everybody, you know. I mean, the, the way I got into business as far as my interest in music was the first time I heard gospel music. I thought it was the greatest music I've ever heard in my life. You know, I still do. And that's, that's what inspired me to, to be more of an R&B kind of rhythm player. That's all I ever wanted to do. 
and I used to go to, to some of the, the gospel shows and, and, and watch these bands and watch these gospel guys play the guitar. Man, I'd go home and work on that, you know, playing those old shuffle beats and stuff. I mean, that was just, that was the greatest music I ever heard. So was that your influence? Basically, yeah. I mean, I grew up on rock and roll like everybody else, you know, you, you got a little Chuck Berry, you got all this, but my mentor would have been Bo Diddley. I mean, that's the stuff I grew up on. Uh, one of the first songs I learned was Honky Tonk by Bill Doggett. That was like everybody's favorite song. You couldn't play guitar unless you knew Honky Tonk. <laughs> the only problem was we learned it in the wrong key, but, uh, you know, that we found out later that the record is not in E, it's in F. You can't hardly play that song in F. So I don't know if Billy Butler was tuned to a chord or not. I, I never got to ask him, but uh, you know, it's, a, it's just a great song. It's a great guitar song. It'll, it'll definitely go down in history.